Roll sound. Marker. Scene one, take 77. And action! Okay, come into the frame, walk towards the table. You see the flower. The flower is the most beautiful thing. Reach out for the flower. Reach out for the flower. You're, you're going to Ouch. smell it. It's the, most, it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your whole life. Don't look at the camera. You see the flower. Look at the flower. Keep your focus on the flower. Bring it up to your face. Smell it. Smell the flower. It's beautiful. No, cut. Oh, man. You really get what you pay for, I'll tell you what. Hi, I'm Debbie Rashawn, and this is Trailer Park, where we feature the best, the worst, the weirdest horror and sci-fi movie trailers in all the universe. All right, everybody, back to one. We're gonna keep on doing this till we get it right. Directing a movie is not easy. Shut mm -hmm. up! You have hundreds of people you have to control. You have expensive and heavy equipment you have to deal with. You have brain-dead actors you have to try to direct. Yeah. You know, it's just amazing that a movie gets done at all. And if you make a good movie, it's nothing short of a miracle. It's a miracle! And some directors can make a good movie time and time again. Great. They're what you call miracle workers. So today, we're gonna focus on Every director has to start somewhere. And in the 1960s, there was no better place for a young and ambitious director than with the great Roger Corman. Corman gave lots of future cinema giants their first directing gigs. Martin Scorsese, Jonathan Demme, Ron Howard. But the first great director that came out of the Corman school was Francis Ford Coppola, director of the Godfather trilogy. Coppola was a second unit director on The Young Racers. He asked Corman if he could have $30,000, his cast, his crew, and the location of the movie, so he could shoot his own movie simultaneously. Corman said yes, and the result, Dementia 13. In 1960, I was consulted regarding a tragic case of a triple murderer who strangled his victims immediately after viewing the movie Psycho. His fascinating analysis under hypnosis, now a matter of record in my book, came to the attention of the producers of Dementia 13, who asked me to devise a method of preventing a recurrence of this tragedy. You will be given a test prepared by Dr. Bryant to determine your ability to withstand shock. Those unable to pass this test will not be admitted to the theater. In this old castle, death is the youngest thing alive. For it is born and reborn 13 times, each time from a different dementia. A miasma of madness hides the one who delivers death, one who walks with silent tread and strikes with ruthless force. Is it the mother, demented by grief, or the attentive daughter-in-law, whose voice is soothingly hypnotic? She'll tell me. I promise you. Is it the sun who with fire creates beauty? Or the doctor who can cure and kill? Or perhaps the new bride, tortured by the ever-present nearness of death? Know the frenzy of a wedding night in which a marriage is consummated in a passion of terror. You too will be mesmerized by a world that cannot be, but is. The movements of the static startles the wisest of birds. The mystery of the enigmatic leads to a strange rendezvous, an attempted escape, a meeting with terror.
One of the most respected horror movie helmers of all time is Italian director Mario Bava. Ciao. Tim Burton, Quentin Tarantino, Martin Scorsese have all cited him as a great influence. Which is kind of ironic considering Bava really never wanted to direct. He was perfectly happy being a cinematographer for friend and director Ricardo Freda. Now, Freda knew Bava had exactly what it took to be a great director. Hey, can you, so hey. very often he would quit in the middle of a project, and Bava would take over and get directing experience. Bava eventually caught the fever and made his solo directorial debut with Black Sunday. Not since Dracula stalked the earth has the world known so terrifying a day or night. It's I who renounce you. And in the name of Satan, I place a curse upon you. Black Sunday is like no motion picture you've ever seen. There are those who believe and those who do not. But both must know the suspense, the shock of meeting the living dead and of bringing the dead to life. Look into my eyes. Embrace me. You will die. But I can bring you pleasures mortals cannot know. Sunday, the most terrifying motion picture you'll ever see. Satan, wearing strange robes and fighting with all the furies of Hades, arouses the countryside to a frenzy of black terror. so hard, I decided to splurge, and I bought you pizza for lunch. Ingrate. <sighs> working with a low budget just ain't easy. But there are some directors who thrive on working with limited resources, like Edgar G. Ulmer, director of Daughter of Dr. Jekyll. He had a few successes with some low-budget films, but he got his big break when he was hired to do the big-budget version of Edgar Allan Poe's The Black Cat. It was a huge hit with the audiences. But Hollywood wasn't a hit with Ulmer. He missed the excitement and the freedom of working outside the Hollywood system. And soon he went back to making horror and film noir cheapies. Which is why he is cited as being one of the first truly independent filmmakers. Daughter of Dr. Jekyll, yearning for love and discovering on the eve of her marriage the monstrous inheritance that was her birthright of fear. Oh, I still shudder when I recall that face, like some perverted mask of evil out of a legend of horror. Then you saw him as Hyde? Once, at the very last, just before the mob caught him. They almost tore him to pieces. The villagers broke into this tomb and drove a stake through his heart. Daughter of Dr. Jekyll, terrified that she become the disfigured thing that was her father, a vampire drawing sustenance from bestiality. and drive it through my heart and bury me beside my father. Well, do it! Do I have to kill myself? If you love me, please kill me!
after this brief announcement, we will take a look at the grand pappy of the horror genre. I, of course, am speaking of Sir Alfred Hitchcock, so stay tuned for more horrifying movie trailers on Trailer Park. First time I was really scared. I saw it when I was like four, and I couldn't watch another horror movie for like ten years after that. It looks Stephen King. Stephen King's it. Is something about that clown just freaked me out. And he's still afraid of him to this day. My second was probably my marriage. That's a tough one. I can't actually remember being scared of anything, really. Freddy's original glove was used in the 1985 sequel, A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, Freddy's Revenge, before it went missing. Somehow it ended up in the 1986 movie, Evil Dead 2. Alfred Hitchcock is often quoted as saying, all actors are cattle. When asked about this later in his career, he said, I never said all actors are cattle. I said all actors need to be treated like cattle. Well, if this one doesn't start producing soon, he's gonna see the inside of a butcher shop. Anyway, despite his lack of respect for acting, Alfred Hitchcock is a name that must be mentioned when talking about great horror movie directors, as you will see in this segment we like to call... <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock had a thing for blondes, especially when they were icy yet vulnerable. So he really must have had a circus tent when he was filming Marnie. It was about a beautiful blonde thief who takes no pleasure in sex. That's the icy part. But who is tormented by a traumatic event that happened in her childhood, which still haunts her. That's the vulnerable part. When it was released in 1964, the critics savaged it. But since then, it's been reevaluated and is now considered a late period Hitchcock Masterpiece. How do you do? I am Alfred Hitchcock, and I would like to tell you about my latest motion picture, Marnie which will be coming to this theater soon. Marnie is a very difficult picture to classify. It is not psycho, nor do we have a horde of birds flapping about and pecking at people willy-nilly. We do have two very interesting human specimens, a man and a woman. One might call Marnie a sex mystery, that is, if one used such words, but it is more than that. Perhaps the best way to tell you about the picture is to show you a few scenes. This is Mark coming down the stairs of his family home outside Philadelphia. He is a thoughtful man, dark and brooding. He is, in a sense, a hunter. And this is what he is hunting, Marnie. Seeing her in her mother's modest house, one wonders how two such different people could cross paths. It was certainly not Marnie's idea. Marnie was going about her own business like any normal girl. Happy, happy, happy. Suddenly into this colorful life comes Mark. At first he didn't know what to make of Marnie. She does seem a rather excitable type. What would account for this strange behavior? 
Has she just realized that she forgot her umbrella? The colors. Stop the colors. What colors? Marnie's trouble goes deeper than that. Far deeper. And this is the problem which Mark must probe. But first, something must be done to calm this girl. Our hero applies mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. But that may give you the impression this picture is all sex and no mystery. Not so at all. Here, for example, Marnie is speaking to, uh, I'm not sure who actually, but he is a man from her past, a past she seems to be denying. Oh dear, they're at it again. Let me assure you that this is all in the spirit of investigation. And this, here is further proof that Marnie is a talking picture. You don't love me. I'm just something you caught. You think I'm some kind of animal you've trapped. That's right, you are. And I've caught something really wild this time, haven't I? I've tracked you and caught you, and by God, I'm going to keep you. That should be quite enough. If you wish to hear more, you will have to buy a ticket. As for which one of them is the wild animal, there are times when I'm not sure. <laughs>